Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's event, a discussion of economic inequality after the pandemic. My name is John Torpy. I'm director of the Ralph Bunch Institute for International Studies and of the European Union Studies Center at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. I'm very pleased to be here today and to welcome our three panelists who I'd like to introduce now. Uh, first, we welcome Angela McEwen, who is Senior Economist at the Canadian Union of Public Employees, better known as CUPE, and a Policy Fellow with the Broadbent Institute. Her research focuses on understanding the Canadian labor market, broader economic trends, and the impacts of social policy on workers. She regularly represents the CUPE at parliamentary committees and in the national media. She holds an MA in economics from Dalhousie University and a BA in international development studies from St. Mary's University. She joins us today from Ottawa. Next, uh, my colleague Branko Milanovic is senior scholar at the Stone Center on Socioeconomic Inequality at the CUNY Graduate Center. He served as lead economist in the World Bank's research department for almost 20 years. His book, The Haves and the Have-Nots from 2011 was selected by The Globalist as the 2011 book of the year. Uh, our next book, Global Inequality, A New Approach for the Age of Globalization, published in 2016, was awarded the Bruno Kreisky Prize for the Best Political Book of 2016 and the Hans Mathurfer Prize in 2018 and has been translated into 16 languages. His new book, Capitalism Alone, The Future of the System that Rules the World, was published in September 2019. And finally, Wolfgang Schmidt is State Secretary in the Federal Ministry of Finance in Germany, responsible for fiscal policy strategy and international economy and finance. He has held a variety of senior positions in the local government of his native city of Hamburg and in the German government. Most relevant for our discussion today, uh, Mr. Schmidt served as director of the Office of Policy Planning in the Federal Ministry of Labor and Social Affairs. He has a law degree from the University of Hamburg and joins us today from Berlin. I want to, uh, before we go to the questions, I want to thank our co-sponsors for this event. Uh, first of all, the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung or Foundation, uh, their Washington DC office and Knut Panknin in particular. Uh, the American Council on Germany, the Stone Center on Inequality at the Graduate Center of CUNY, that I've already mentioned, the Colorado European Union Center of Excellence, and the University of Florida Center for European Studies. I want to thank you all for joining us today. We're going to have a conversation that will last about 40 minutes or so, and then at uh, around 12.45 uh, Eastern Standard Time, we'll uh, go over to questions. So if you have questions, please uh, send them to the question and answer uh, function. So I begin with a question that, you know, is obvious for the uh, theme that we've chosen, uh, but is obviously of huge consequences for uh, many, many millions of people in the countries represented in this discussion and, of, and around the world. So the, the first question basically is, what will be the consequences of the pandemic for inequality within societies? And perhaps I'd like to ask Angela McEwen to begin. Thank you. Um, so from the Canadian perspective, there were three groups of, of people that were affected differently by the pandemic broadly. We had workers that could work from home uh, with their families. And for them, the pandemic has been stressful, but they've largely been able to keep their incomes um, and, and they've been spending less money because there's less things for them to do. They can't go out to see a movie or, or fly to visit their family or, well, most of them <laughs> can't. The very, very rich still manage to do that stuff. Um, and then there was a group of workers that were laid off. Um, those tended to be low wage workers. 
uh, in the service industry. And then there was another group of workers that were deemed essential and uh, had to keep going into work. So those are healthcare workers, um, warehouse workers, agriculture workers, and the pandemic affected each of them very differently. And so I think that the government of Canada had a pretty good response for the workers that were laid off. Um, they provided immediate financial assistance directly to people. Um, and so a lot of people that were low income workers that were laid off actually got more money from that assistance than they would have if they were working. And so they'll be financially, most of them better off after the pandemic. Workers who had to keep going to work, they had a brief um, pay bump, but that was taken back by May of last year. Um, and they're really struggling um, because it's more expensive to go to work. Uh, it's more dangerous to go to work. They have to find childcare for their kids when schools or daycares are closed. Um, and that's, that's difficult and expensive. And so it has exacerbated inequality. Um, low wage jobs without a lot of bargaining power were least able to protect themselves. Um, and so that's what we've seen in Canada. And I think that's somewhat what we might see, see globally. Um, nations that were able to control the virus and lock down very quickly and almost eliminate it, like Australia, um, some other countries, maybe their economies will perform better than uh, countries that weren't able to control the virus. Right. So maybe I'll ask Wolfgang Schmidt to address that question as well, since Bronco is in some sense our international sort of roving ambassador. Yes, yeah, sure. Um, and I would say the situation obviously in Germany is concerning the labor market is pretty much the same as in Canada and also our measures are, are pretty much the same with probably one difference to the US and Canada, but in Germany, people got not laid um, off, but um, went into short um, time working. So uh, due to our labor laws, there is more protection even for low skilled workers, um, restaurants and so on and so on. And so these people um, received a bump in their payments because short-term work allowance um, a furlough law scheme um, only substitutes, depending on how long you are in that scheme, 60 or with children, 67 to then 87 percent of your former wage. But obviously for waitresses and, and people working in restaurants, the tips um, are, are not compensated. So basically, I would say in labor market, you've seen um, a big problem for those kind of workers, um, low skill, low wages. We got a real problem with the self-employed because we realized that our um, social protection system is not made for these people who never contributed into an assurance system. Um, and then I would say we have other dimensions of equality that we should also uh, look at. Um, coming from a man, it might sound strange, but I think the gender question is obviously one. So homeschooling, um, I think it, it made pretty clear that there is no way a 50-50 um, share of that um, workload. So the homeschooling in many families was left um, with uh, women, with the mothers. Uh, we also have, I would say, um, inequality amongst companies. So meanwhile, many of our shops needed to be closed. Um, uh, Amazon and, and, and Zoom and, and the cloud service providers, um, they saw and they saw historic high of, of revenues and have tons of cash. Meanwhile, many others are, are facing liquidity shortage or even solvency problems. And then maybe finally in, in wealth inequality, I would say we saw what we saw also before the pandemic, um, that those who have the um, stock markets are rising, asset prices went up. So we see this kind of, of equality or inequality rising as well. Uh, Branko, do you want to talk about this a little bit from a more international perspective? You're, you're muted, Branko. Just a few words. I, I, I totally agree with what uh, Angela and Wolfram said. You know, it is, these are really the developments that we see. I'm a kind of a data person. I still don't have these developments in numbers. But for example, when I look back to 2007 and 8, 
you know, the extension of unemployment benefits under Obama did actually show up in the lower income households, even in the data. So I would expect this massive uh, uh, amount of uh, um, transfers and actually the, the stimulus package also to show up because to be, and then Wolfgang can correct me on that because I may not be right on this, but we have never had in history such uh, uh, extreme expansion. We're talking about 20% of GDP in some cases. So it will show in the numbers. But of course, there are these other inequalities that both Angela and, and, uh, and the Wolfgang mentioned that are maybe non-measurable in that sense that I'm talking. So there could be inequalities in gender, there could be inequalities in people who actually had lost jobs and maybe they would not lose so much money, but they really had to basically change, to go to a work to something totally differently. And then there is this really interesting issue of large increases in wealth. And this is not only in, in the rich countries, we see it in China as well, you know, with and where actually the, 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 the pandemic was relatively well controlled. But then again, the fact that actually people and, uh, who are making lots of money and were working in companies or owning rather the companies that do like uh, uh, e-trading, e e-commerce are really doing extremely well. So we have really a very unusual situation, very hard to grasp and put in like one or two sentences. Interesting. I mean, uh, the next question I really want to ask is, of course, what do we do about these problems? I mean, to some extent, uh, this has basically been a story of the exacerbation of already existing, pre-existing kind of inequalities. And so in that sense, there may be nothing kind of magical or novel that needs to be done. Uh, but it is worth, I think, saying, you know, of course, Bronco has mentioned already in the United States that enormous amounts of money are being spent to dig us out of the economic hole that we've gotten ourselves in. Uh, but we just hear today that both in New York and, and yesterday uh, with regard to the U.S. more generally, if there's a kind of concerted effort uh, going on to raise taxes on the wealthy, to collect taxes uh, that are being, you know, sort of offshored by American corporations and try to make sure that this so-called race to the bottom, uh, sort of tax race to the bottom is stemmed. So, uh, you know, what would you say uh, is the best thing that we can, or the best things that we can do in response to this, uh, I think, unprecedented economic, the, 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 in terms of the nature of it, not necessarily the size, but the nature of this crisis was so unprecedented. Angela? So I have uh, actually just finished writing a book with a colleague on um, wealth taxes and not just um, net wealth taxes, but the other ways that over the past, you know, 20 to 30 years, uh, Canada and other countries have cut taxes on the rich and we've deregulated and we've made more flexible labor markets. And so there has been a shift of power, a steady shift of power away from um, the working class, the middle class, towards these multinational corporations. They're really, really big. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a global issue. And so I, I think that we need to start reorienting our um, uh, public services, our tax policy, our, our regulation frameworks towards putting people first. Um, because the next crisis or the crisis that was already happening in the climate crisis, we're gonna need that uh, approach as well. And so we need different thinking about uh, how much wealth is appropriate for individuals to have or families to have. Um, in Canada, there are over a hundred billionaires while there are people that, uh, you know, don't have anywhere to sleep at night <laughs> in our biggest city. We're so wealthy as a country, um, but we don't have clean water on uh, in First Nations communities in rural areas. They've been on drinking water advisories for years. So um, I, I hope that what we see is a shift in priorities and a shift in thinking. A lot of this thinking had been driven by, uh, you know, trickle down economics. It's clear now trickle down economics doesn't work. That's not how you grow an economy. That's not how you get a prosperous economy. So I think 
as an economist, <laughs> part of the part of the solution is thinking differently about economics and thinking and, and putting people first in our public policy and, and in the way we think about our economics. And of course, transfers to people, that's a start, um, but that doesn't fundamentally shift any power relations. So we have to start doing things that will fundamentally shift those power relations. Wolfgang? Yeah, I, I, again, I pretty much agree. Um, so on, on the power question, I think it is important if you look at, at the sectors that and the workers that, that are affected, um, the service industry, uh, the cashiers, the cleaning staff, nurses, very often they are not unionized and they are not covered by collective wage agreements. And so there is, there is a problem of power between workers and, and the employers. And I think um, we need to strengthen um, this idea of collective bargaining. That is one question. The other one, obviously, is taxation on the on the income side. Um, there, I think the work that um, we are doing, and we just got a boost by by the new US administration on a global um, minimum taxation and the redistribution, so digital taxation or taxing the digital economy that we are doing at the OECD, the so-called inclusive framework is important and hopefully we can finish the works uh, by the end or by mid, mid 2021, so this year. Um, and then there's the question also how to spend the money. So not to cut in, in um, financial assistance, um, not to cut social welfare um, after the pandemic and, and that obviously giving um, the high amount of debt in many countries will probably lead us to a new round of discussions as we saw it after the financial crisis. And I think it's important, um, especially for progressives, um, to, to learn the lesson from the last crisis and not return to a pulse way of austerity, um, especially here in Europe. I think that the US Americans this time are doing it um, way better, also probably with the right amount of money. And, uh, there's some dispute as I, I hear, but um, for us, I think it is important to, to, to continue also to invest into the future because one group that I forgot to mention when it comes to inequality is obviously the children. Um, children of, of better off families, they have no problem with homeschooling and, and dad and mum can probably help even with the complicated mass classes. Meanwhile, for families um, that even lack um, the, the, the tablet or a computer to follow digital classes, we first need to provide that stuff and then probably assistance. Um, and as they have not seen their teachers for four months, they're falling behind. And so what we need to do there is that we make sure that there is an equal access to education um, so that, that um, we have... Um, that we invest into, into this sector as well. Um, and I think these are some of the elements that, that we need for the post-pandemic uh, e economy and society. Right, thank you. So Branko, from a international perspective, perhaps, how do you see these issues? Well, uh, let me say something because I cannot avoid like, saying something from the US perspective first. Okay. Uh, I'm actually quite, uh, uh, how should I say, encouraged by what are the first moves by the Biden administration, because I think this is really a fairly important change. And given the conditions today with the Congress and all that, that seems to be the, the best possible. And when I read, for example, the Wall Street Journal saying that this is like the end of the Reaganomics, which basically was reigning supreme from 1980 to today, I feel that there is probably some truth to that. Even if the, for example, the corporate tax rate, as we all know, even if it goes back to 28%, would be still lower than it was under Obama. But of course, the Wall Street Journal doesn't really address the level. It says only the change. So it looks only at the delta. Uh, but nevertheless, I think it's an important change. And then I mm -hmm. want to point out to another important, I think, factor that was kind of, seldom mentioned, uh, which indirectly shows the importance of taxation and government. And this is the, the fact that in this really severe crisis, we really have not had any help from, or almost any help from philanthropical organizations that every February in Davos, 
tell us that they are going to give 99% of their wealth. You know, we have seen this from everybody. They have even websites and they are promising. But if you look at what they have done this time, it's almost nothing. I know that, of course, Bill Gates has done something and I think Jack Ma has done something. But for the others, I have not heard a word. So that by implication means that if you really have a crisis, all these talks about philanthropical associations like taking over the slack from the government, uh, they have been really shown empty. And I think we should take this into account in the future and realize that what we really need, we need a social coordination and we need like every organized society really to be taxed. I couldn't agree more. I recently did some research with a German colleague, Hilke Brockmann, and you know we found that people like Mackenzie Bezos gave away $4 billion, but they made more than that in the pandemic because of the shift of all the activity as Wolfgang has uh, mentioned you know, to sellers like Amazon. So, uh, you know, the, the philanthropic uh, side of this is something you can't really count on. I think that's absolutely right. So, um, I mean, another question, of course, arises about globalization. I mean, many aspects of the crisis have been seen as attributable to the globalization of supply chains, the, the offshoring of various kinds of manufacturing. I mean, how do you see the, uh, the pandemic uh, affecting you know, this phenomenon or process of globalization. Angela? So there certainly has been a discussion in Canada about what types of industries uh, we have chosen to protect and what types of industries maybe we should be looking more at. Like, for example, um, production of, of uh, protective equipment. When the pandemic first hit, we didn't have enough masks and we couldn't make them. Um, we didn't have the stuff that you needed to make tests. Um, we didn't, we don't um, have a, a public, re really a public research capacity um, for vaccines. And we've had an agreement with the, the private sector that they haven't held up their, their bargain to. We have an easy regulatory regime for them and they're supposed to then turn around and invest 10% of R&D in Canada, uh, the big pharmaceutical companies, but they haven't, they're below 4% now. So Canada has really gone from in the 50s and 60s from being a leader on in world vaccines on polio and smallpox and and other, other um, elements of that to not having any national capacity at all. And so uh, there is a discussion about, should we have publicly owned, should, is this infrastructure that we actually need as a country going forward? Do we need to have infrastructure where we're building our own ventilators here, where we have the parts um, to make that, that what we need for vaccines? Um, there's also a concern about the stimulus in the United States uh, that that will be by American. And so that's Canada's biggest trading partner. We're very integrated um, from the, the North American free trade agreement that we've had in place uh, since the early 90s. And so that would hurt Canada a lot. Um, but before we've been able to manage to get exemptions for Canadian production and to work as an integrated, more integrated economy. So we're hoping that, that we can do that as well this time. Um, and then if, if we can do that, the stimulus will help our economy, we'll grow and, and we'll be able to, to ensure that we can share resources uh, with them. So it's still a little bit up in the air, I think. Um, it's definitely gonna be something, uh, especially in the healthcare front, I think that people are looking at a lot more. Right, Wolfgang? Yeah, surprisingly, again, I, I share many of what Angela said. And um, I mean, we hear a lot about this whole discussion on decoupling. Um, and I would say, yes, we see trends toward that. We see export controls. We see something that we don't like so much, even with the Biden administration, when it comes to vaccines and um, a, a approach of America first. Um, but my general feeling is, despite all the trade controversies that we see also with China and other parts, that we won't see a real decoupling and the end of globalization. Um, markets and economies are too much interconnected. What, what I think we will see is, is obviously a focus on 
um, some essential goods and we learned that masks, for example, can be essential goods, but especially um, on vaccines, we, we see how important it is um, to, to be able to produce them. We also realized that um, that there are global supply chains and we also saw, especially I think in the first um, months of the pandemic last year, how vulnerable these supply changes, changes are. And we saw that especially in Europe, um, where out of a sudden we had um, shortages in the automobile industry in Germany because parts from um, Italy couldn't make it to Germany or Airbus called me urgently uh, asking for some parts that were stuck due to the lockdown in uh, near Madrid in Spain. So we, we definitely um, see the flaws and the problems um, of, of these global supply chains. Um, but I'm, I'm not a fan of this theory that, that this will end everything. Nevertheless, um, I think it, it, it will somehow showcase a, a hierarchy of countries. And, and, and on the top, obviously, you have um, a country um, like the US that has the dollar and um, has basically the freedom to do whatever it wants um, when it comes to um, export controls and limiting um, other countries' uh, ability to access goods that are produced in the US. And, and I think that um, other countries will react on that and, and will consider, um, I'd say, diversification of production. So um, not to put all your eggs in one basket, but to diversify also regionally um, to make sure that you are not um, the, 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 the victim of, of a sudden change in policies. Branco, you're, you're muted again. We seem to agree on this one too. Let me, uh, uh, let me say actually for global value chains, it, in my impression, and of course, Wolgan and uh, John know that better, but they have survived pretty well. Uh, if you remember in the very beginning, there were some issues in supplies, there were some shortages, but eventually we actually did really pretty well as, as the world, much better than we maybe thought in the beginning. It did show some fragilities. And of course, as Angela said, uh, I, I believe that many countries would go now into the production of self-sufficiency of certain types of goods. The danger with that, and, it, and unfortunately, I don't have an answer to that, is like all generals, we are fighting the last war. So we will be now doing very well in masks, for example. But maybe the, the next crisis would be very different. So we'll, maybe we'll need, I don't know, body protection. You know, so, you know, we're a little bit fighting, I think, this last war. So I don't have an answer what will be the next one, but I'm just uh, observing that. And then uh, the uh, next point, about global value chain, uh, one thing which might change, and well, I've seen some indications of that, is because of the political relations between the US and China, uh, there could be some, uh, how should I say, relocation. So globally speaking, the global value chains would remain, but maybe some which would have gone to China might go to, to Vietnam, for example, or India. So there may be some uh, uh, reallocation but uh, uh, overall, I think we have done actually pretty well, uh, you know, much better than I think we feared in the beginning. Great, thank you. So uh, the next question I wanna ask has to do with the mobility of labor. Uh, how do you think the pandemic has affected the mobility of labor? I mean, obviously, Immigration has been a huge issue in the political landscape in the United States uh, in the last five years. And of course, more than that in Germany since the arrival of a million or so people from the Middle East and elsewhere. Uh, don't really know so much about the Canadian situation, but it's obviously been a major kind of issue on the political landscape and is seen, of course, as a kind of inequality, a jobs competition issue in many quarters. So how, how would you expect things to develop on the immigration front, Angela? So Canada is looking uh, to grow largely by increasing immigration streams. In the past, we focused on um, 
economic uh, and, and high skilled labor for permanent immigration. And, and over the past 10 to 15 years, we've increased the amount of migrant workers or temporary workers um, that we rely on, especially in healthcare. So um, in childcare, in homes, in uh, personal support workers, and uh, also in agriculture. So um, workers working in food processing and, um, and in Southwest Ontario here, uh, where we grow a lot of things like tomatoes. And, and so there are a lot of agricultural workers that aren't, don't have permanent residence. And so that creates a situation where they don't have the same protections as other workers. Agricultural workers in Ontario are not allowed to unionize. So they don't have um, a union to speak up for them. They access healthcare through their employer. Um, they live in bunkhouses altogether. So um, these workers were incredibly exposed to COVID-19 in the pandemic, and more people became aware of how vulnerable um, their health situation was, their economic situation was, because if you speak up to your employer, if you acknowledge that you're sick and you need to go to the doctor, there's, there's always the chance that they might send you home because you're no longer a valuable worker. Um, and so there are huge disparities in, um, in how migrant workers are treated, how they're paid, um, what types of supports they're able to access that hopefully we can address now because more people have become aware of them. Um, there has been a rise in anti-Asian um, hate across Canada with the pandemic. There have been certain premiers and other political leaders that have adopted Trump's um, calling it a China virus. And so that has definitely um, made Canada less welcoming, I think, maybe to, to some immigrants. And so that won't be um, in our favor as we're looking to expand our, our workforce. I think that we're trying to address those issues. Um, and I really think that that doesn't necessarily help international equality <laughs> if we're trying to attract the best and brightest uh, to come here. Um, then we're we're pulling resources away from other countries. Mm -hmm. Wolfgang, uh, I think it's it's still very difficult to predict um, what will happen because we are we are just in the midst of everything. So if you look, I think the OECD. I just looked it up. Um, the OECD International Migration Outlook said that the OECD countries' admission for foreigners decreased by 46% in the first half of 2020. Um, we see obviously a short, uh, a, a sharp decline in remittances. Um, we see it if you look at the, the refugee numbers. Um, and, and I think we have to look at the different sectors of migration. So when we talk about migration um, for Europe, for example, I would always say we have the free movement of people within Europe as the first group. Um, there we saw after the financial crisis that um, inner European mobility rose because in the south of Europe um, and many countries we had economic hardships so people just made use of their freedom of movement and went up to those countries that were not hit um, that hard. That might happen again as we see many parts of Europe hit very hard by the crisis and probably even with all the recovery funds that we now mobilized, we will, we will see some difficulties in Spain, Portugal, uh, Greece, Italy and, and, and the center and, and, the south, uh, and the eastern countries. Then you have the, the labor migration, both the regular one and the irregular one. Um, there it really depends on how the crisis and the post-pandemic economic recovery develops, both within the countries where there's the need of labor. And I think what Angelia said, um, the, the, the healthcare workers, there's, there's a constant demand and the same is true for agriculture. Um, and then you might have other parts where there's not so much pressure. And obviously um, the question how the situation um, evolves in um, those countries where migrants come from, um, in Africa for, for the European case or Latin America for the US case. Now, it depends how hard the economies are hit, how much the pressure is, um, the push factor, so that people um, go on the move. And then you have finally refugees, obviously, um, this is a question on the international 
stability. We see things happening in Ukraine at the moment with new movements by, by Russian forces at the border. We see Syria still, um, still a war going on. We, we see stuff happening in Africa. So I think it's very difficult to, to really say what is going on. Then we have, and we'll come to that, I guess, and, and, and Branko wrote about it, the, the whole question of remote working and teleworking. Um, so what kind of migration uh, will that then um, uh, trigger or not trigger? Um, because people can stay actually at home and do this or in their home country and do the same work. So basically, I don't know. It's 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 a crystal ball and um, it's blinded at the moment. Mine at least. Right. Maybe Broncos is better. The snow hasn't settled in the crystal ball yet, but, but Bronco maybe can. No, I, I have not actually looked. It's over <laughs> here, but let me look at it later. Uh, I, I do. I, I think actually, as I said, so I will not. And Wolfgang said it as well. Uh, I won't want to repeat that, but I do believe that in the longer term, we would have had a, the effect of the crisis would have been really to mimic a global labor market simply because many activities we have discovered we can do it remotely. We knew technically that before, it's not that the technology was developed now, but we never really did it in such a grand scale that we have now. So I think this would be really a major turning point in that respect. Now, what does it mean for many of these countries? I really don't know. Of course, you will have people staying in that country and they would spend money in that country. So that's good for those countries. On the other hand, uh, some people said to me, well, that would stop the brain drain. But that's not exactly the case. If I'm actually from Serbia originally, and if I'm working for a Canadian company, and actually I have a friend in Serbia who is working for a Canadian company, how does it actually reduce the brain drain? His, I mean, it has some other effect that he will be spending money in his country, but other than that, there is no reduction in the brain drain. So that's one issue. Another thing which I think this crisis brought up from the other perspective is what I've again seen. I've read it about Hungary. I've read it in Serbia. I've read it in Bulgaria. Shortage of doctors and nurses, because many of them went, because they were much better paid mostly in Germany. So they went there. And then when the system, without the crisis, the system somehow managed it. But when the crisis hit, so you really now have a problem at, in countries that were exporting labor. So we really have a problem not only in countries importing labor for all the reasons that we know and we talked and Angela mentioned, we do have a problem also in the uh, exporting countries because certain types of uh, professions are not at all easily you know, replaceable. If you need a doctor, you need, for example, whatever, seven years of education. So you're not actually going to produce these doctors you know, tomorrow. Uh, so there are many, I think, issues that uh, the crisis has, has really uh, you know, brought to, to a fore. And um, as Wolfgang said before, and I think Argel as well, um, we are still in the midst of this crisis. We don't know how it would work out. I mean, if you look at numbers in Brazil, for example, or India, they are actually horrible. Uh, and uh, we don't see yet an ending to this. So really, we are in the middle. Okay, thank you very much. I mean, it's 1240 and some questions are starting to roll in. So maybe we'll turn to the question and answer now. Uh, and I, I want to take a question uh, from my former boss, the interim president of the Graduate Center, James Meiskins, who's basically asking a question that others are asking as well, which, and, and Bronco is in some ways already, you've all sort of uh, spoken to this, but the, the basic question is, uh, insofar as the pandemic has exposed a number of the pre-existing inequalities, um, has this created a stronger demand and a collective commitment to addressing those inequalities? I mean, I think part of what Branco was describing uh, is going on in the Biden administration is this kind of notion that you know, we're in this crisis moment and Rahm Emanuel famously said, you know, never let a good crisis go to waste. Uh, and you kind of get the impression that that's the, the dominant uh, sort of way of thinking about at least the economic side of things in the Biden uh, White House. So maybe you could speak to this from the point of view of your own, uh, you know, capitals and, and your own perceptions of the rest of the world. Angela? Yeah, so in Canada, 
um, about seven, they've done polling and about 70% of Canadians support a wealth tax now and an excess profits tax um, to help pay for the pandemic recovery. We're seeing people less concerned about federal government debt um, than they have been in the past. Um, and, and we're seeing people, we've been talking about, so QP uh, represents a lot of workers in long-term care, and we've been talking about the crisis in long-term care probably for 10 years. Um, but the pandemic really kind of woke people up and Canada has a mixed public-private system and the private care homes, um, when there was an outbreak, they had a higher death rate um, because they have lower staffing ratios and, and because of a whole bunch of other reasons where they're pro prioritizing profit over care. Um, and they rely on a part-time workforce and they rely on a largely migrant workforce. Um, and, and so I think so. I think in a few areas, parents have also become incredibly aware of how hard teachers work and what that looks like. Um, we are having a conversation around childcare in this country. We've been trying to get a universal childcare system in place. I mean, probably longer than I've been alive. Feminists have been working for this, but it's a real conversation now and people are really understanding how it is infrastructure for to make the economy work. They're like, oh, if women can't go to work, then there's not that um, production, there's not that tax revenue, there's, there's this, this is missing. And so this actually is infrastructure that makes our economy work just like a road or a bridge would be. So there are some conversations that are shifting. Um, and I think that people are seeing things, uh, more people are seeing things uh, that they, they kind of didn't have time for before. They didn't know what's happening. They were busy in their lives and they're like, ah, I'll worry about it later. Um, but it's kind of made it very difficult to avoid, right. I, I think. And I hope that that will spur change. Right. So Wolfgang, I mean, the Germans are famously debt averse. Uh, how, how is this, uh, you know, impacting, affecting people's thinking about how to deal with this crisis over there? Well, look at look at the numbers. We are, we are running a, a historic high deficit and, and a historic high new debt. Um, so we just had a supplementary budget of another 60 billion euro uh, of debt. And so that will amount to 240 billion of debt this year um, in an overall budget that was planned to have 360 uh, billion. So you see, um, and, and people are not out in the streets marching and, and shouting that uh, my boss, the finance minister should resign. Um, we will face an interesting time though, because we have an election. Uh, in September, and, and my boss Olaf Scholz is one of the candidates to succeed Angela Merkel, who will leave us after 16 years. And so I think we will have, um, after the, 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 the immediate impact of the pandemic will hopefully be over in a few months, we will have this conversation and we will have the possibility for the people to actually speak up by voting and deciding what kind of road they, wanna, they want the country, the society to, to take. Um, and on the on the international level, because this is the week of the spring meetings, and I just came out of, of one of these um, informal G7 meetings, um, it's it's interesting to see that both liberal politicians, conservative politicians, progressive politicians, all sing across the same lines, and 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 you can't really make a a a, a distinction between the, 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 the finance minister of, of the UK from the Conservative Party and a social democrat from, from, from Germany um, or a, a liberal from, from France or now fortunately again um, a democrat from the US. Um, and so I think the response to the crisis and, and, and the understanding that we need collective action also on the international level is there and, and that gives me hope and that is something that I think the world and the G7 and G20 learned from, from the last catastrophe, the, the financial crisis, and, and, and hopefully learned its lesson for this crisis. All right. Thanks. Branko, you're muted. I keep on forgetting. No, no, you're nothing so polite. Actually. 
uh, uh, nothing else to say. So I, I, I mean, maybe we can go to the next question. Right. Okay. Well, I mean, there's been a number of questions that revolve around the issue of migration. I mean, one person is asking whether or not it's, whether any of you expect a kind of surge of migration out of places that have not been doing very well, you know, handling the, uh, handling the pandemic. Of course, many parts of the world, as we know, uh, have virtually no vaccination uh, underway. They just, they don't have the wealth, they don't have the, you know, they didn't get in on the contracts. Uh, so that's a big issue, uh, you know, the sort of need for a global vaccination plan. And I wonder, uh, I mean, I interviewed a couple of Turkish economists not too long ago for our podcast, and, you know, they did a study about the economic consequences of not vaccinating vaccinating everybody and their you know main point in many ways was that this is going to be bad for the wealthier countries as well it's not just a problem for those countries that you know aren't vaccinating their own people so do you see a, a you know a successful global vaccination rollout and how might you know the failure to do that uh, you know uh, sort of have consequences for migration angela Sorry. Um, so the, it's interesting that you mentioned that. So there was a um, request to the World Trade Organization that they waive some um, rules in, in the uh, TRIPS, which is a trade agreement that governs intellectual property. So South Africa and India asked the council um, that governs TRIPS if they could waive it for the pandemic as an emergency. And Canada and the US, and I'm actually not sure about Germany, um, have both sort of been dragging their feet saying, no, we need to, you need to justify to us why you can't do this without us waiving these, these IP waivers. Um, and, and they have, and, and we've still not allowed them to do that. So if these vac most of these vaccines, for example, Moderna's vaccine, um, the research behind that was um, by scientists at the National Institute of Health came up with the innovation. Moderna is publicly funded. A lot of the, the, the clinical trials that they did were publicly funded. Um, even Biotech and Pfizer got some public funding for, for their vaccines and the, they're using the same innovation that Moderna is. And so there was a lot of public funding. This is an emergency. Uh, and Canada and, and the U.S. are still dragging their feet and saying, no, you can't produce generic versions of the vaccine to make sure that the global South is vaccinated um, at least as quickly as, as we could feasibly make that happen. You're going to have to still, you know, pay the licensing fees and negotiate individually with them and, and kind of work through their own capacity issues. So that's a huge issue of inequality that we have baked into our trade agreements um, that that we're not undoing in an emergency. And so that, um, and we've been trying to get, so I'm, I'm the co-chair of the Trade Justice Network in Canada. We've been trying to get people to pay attention and to care about this, um, but people have a lot going on and they're really, <laughs> really worried about what's happening right now. And it doesn't seem to be catch in the imagination that wealthy countries are ordering all the vaccines for themselves and they're not allowing other countries to produce generic versions to vaccinate their people, and it will affect us. There's there's no question um, that there will be more contagious variants, that there will be issues with travel, that there will be issues with workforces. And so, um, yeah, that's a concern. Wolfgang? Well, we have been working on that question, obviously, since since last year, very hard. Um, and and despite this question on, on the international uh, intellectual property, I think um, the question at hand at the moment is how to increase the production of vaccines, and that is a big problem. Um, and it seems to be that the, the, the modern stuff like the mRNA um, vaccines from Moderna and, and BioNTech, Pfizer, are, are very complicated um, procedures and there's shortages in the supply chain that that we are that we are tackling, but we have the financial means. Um, Germany alone has contributed 2.2 billion euro um, to the so-called um, ACT accelerator within the COVAX um, initiative that will provide um, vaccines, therapeutics, diagnostics um, for the world. Um, 
Other countries are there. The European Union has given with the Team Europe 1 billion. Um, Germany actually is the largest um, contributor. But the problem remains that there is no vaccines. So um, AstraZeneca, for example, um, is producing in India. And um, they promise, because it's also Oxford, basically, that, that um, is the research behind it. Um, to provide it, its um, vaccines um, at a self-cost basis. Um, so, so yes, everybody is aware of the fact that um, nobody is safe until everybody is safe. Um, the pragmatic problem is, and this is also a political problem, problem obviously, um, at least here in Europe, we are having big discussions and in Germany that there is, there is not enough um, vaccines for, for the people. So people are really angry and the broad support for the government is declining because people are desperately awaiting their shot in the arm. Um, and so any politician saying, oh, we're going to ship um, millions of doses abroad um, will have a difficult time. And if you look at the numbers, actually Europe is exactly doing that. Um, compared to the US, they are not shipping. Um, Europe is exporting millions of doses all over the world, especially uh, BioNTech um, and, and AstraZeneca. Um, but on the migration thing, that was the root of the question. Um, I think if you look at migration, it's not basically not the poorest that really migrate to the West. Um, so the poorest normally migrate within um, the region. Uh, refugees of war, they flee from one African country to the other one. Uh, Venezuelans flee to Colombia and to the neighboring countries. Um, but it's the middle classes that actually um, make the move to Europe or to US or Canada. Um, with the exception of, of some refugees fleeing Syria and, and, and other parts. Um, and so it, it, it will be an interesting question how, how the pandemic will um, or decrease mobility of these classes um, because they do not have the means because of the economic impacts of the pandemic or whether it will um, push them outside because economic activities do not exist, but they still have enough means to, to migrate. I still think it's, it's too early again. My crystal ball is not working. Right, okay. Well, Branko maybe has one. Well, on, on the <clears throat> migration, really, I, I think, I, I really don't know. It's, it is really way too early and we don't know really how that would affect particularly Africa, you know, uh, which is really crucial for, for Europe. But on, on the vaccines, I think this is really a, a political issue which will stay with us. Uh, because I totally understand Wolfgang and actually understand fully that countries do display, US especially, this uh, sort of vaccine nationalism. If you look at, for example, US promise like really very small quantities to Canada and to Mexico. And if you want to be really, uh, how should I say, mean you can actually look on a per capita basis so per capita canada small quantity but capita, uh, per capita got uh, like four times as much as mexico so you really see these discriminations very uh, sort of clearly and on the other hand you see also the fact which i would not have known had i not read the chinese paper that they have actually exported whether sold or sent for free one half of their production now, obviously, China is in a different, different situation. They have very few infections. They've been put that under control. But, you know, people do notice that. They actually receive them. So I think this problem would, uh, would remain. And uh, uh, as I said, I'm, I wrote that on Twitter. I'm a beneficiary of the U.S. vaccine nationalism because I got really uh, vaccinated in January. So it's, it's very good for me. But uh, I, I, we cannot not see it. And actually that, that would be an issue that would be brought up uh, when it's over. Like, why did we handle it? Uh, when I say we, I mean the world, handle it in such a way. Great, thank you all. Um, we're kind of running out of time. So I, I wanted to ask you if perhaps uh, you might have a final point or two that you might want to make. Uh, we've just got about a, mi a minute per, for each of you. Uh, anything you would like to sort of conclude by by telling us that you think we shouldn't uh, fail to know, Angela? Uh, 
So I think that there is room for positive change out of this. I think that we learned a lesson from the financial crisis, as someone else said. I was living in California at the time, and the chant was the banks got bailed out and we got sold out. Uh, and so governments have made more of an effort in this one to go straight to, to helping people, I feel like, at least um, in, can in Canada, that, that has been more of the approach. It's not entirely successful. Um, and we see huge problems in our social and economic uh, structures. We see um, Amazon making billions of dollars, the owners of Amazon increasing their wealth by billions of dollars. And they're paying workers in warehouses, you know, next to minimum wage. There was uh, an outbreak of 600 people um, at, a, at a warehouse in, in Canada just recently, and they don't have paid sick days, right? So uh, that level of inequality is the kind of thing that makes people really mad um, and that pushes them to fight for change. And so I think that um, we have the pieces in place that we can really make a difference and, and make some really important changes uh, in the coming years following the pandemic. Great, thank you, Angela. Wolfgang. Yeah, I share Angela's um, optimism, uh, but, but I think it's also an open, an open struggle, no? what, what kind of consequences and lessons we learn from this crisis, and hopefully they're economically better than the ones that we learned especially in Europe, from, from the last the financial crisis. And then one, one issue that really concerns me, and, and Branko wrote um, or tapped it in an article in, in Social Europe, and that is the, the whole notion of um, what kind of an impact will these Zoom conferences um, and the, 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 the ability to do work remotely have um, and, and we've known that with the programmers and the call centers and so on and so on. But now it, it, there is a danger that it hits the middle classes. And meanwhile, we are all happy that we can do that and so on. Um, companies and employers are looking at it. Um, I see it in our ministry. We were, we were, we were building a new um, office block and now we are reconsidering and, and, and thinking, do we really need that much space? And this is the first question, which is good. But that comes the next question. Do we really need to have workers, for example, financial analysts living and working and paying them the adequate um, wages in New York? Or can't they do it? Um, and, and can't we force them to live in the countryside as well, um, where we pay a third of their salaries? And, and I think to, to, to think about um, what will happen I'm an optimist. Um, I belong to the working group of optimists in politics. But this is something that that um, that raises some concerns, and and I think we have to be really, really um, careful um, that we don't draw the the wrong lessons from this crisis. Right, Branko. On that point, I would I would of course totally agree. I want to tell you a, a small joke, which I think now it's no longer a joke. But when I worked at the World Bank, there was a joke of a guy who comes to be hired as a consultant. And he says, look, I, maybe I'm caused the same as the other guy who may be better, but I can take a tiny space so I can live like in a tiny room and you don't have to pay the rent for that room. So overall, I will be cheaper. And it was a joke, but it is no longer a joke. You know, if I work from home, I am much cheaper than somebody who is taking a space, as Wolfram was saying, a new building, and you have to pay high rent in New York or Berlin or Washington or wherever. So I, I think it is, a, it is now a reality that actually we have to face, and uh, it, it is a new world in that respect for all of us. Right. Thank you so much. Uh, it's time for us to wind up. I want to thank our panelists, Angela McEwen from the Canadian Union of Public Employees, Wolfgang Schmidt from the Federal Ministry of Finance in Germany, uh, and Branko Milanovic, my colleague from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. I wanna thank Meryl Sovner from the EU Study Center at the Graduate Center for her assistance in making this event possible, and the IT folks uh, behind it all, making sure that the trains run on time and that you can see and hear us all. Thank you all for joining us in the audience and for your questions, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks very much.